All right, I think we're gonna kick off the panel. Uh, I'm so excited to welcome you all today to Labor Conditions and Mental Health, the psychology of working for capitalism today. And uh, with me is Josh Cohen, professor of literary theory at Goldsmiths and a practicing psychoanalyst, as well as the author of Not Working. Uh, Sarah Jaffe, um, an acclaimed labor journalist whose work you may have seen uh, more or less anywhere you see labor journalism, as well as the author of Work Won't Love You Back. And then finally, uh, Richard Seymour, uh, who's joining us for the second time, um, author of Twittering Machine and, and most recently, The Disenchanted Earth. Uh, and so I'm very excited to welcome you all today. We're going to have three uh, more or less 20 minute panels followed by some questions among the panelists and audience Q and A. So if you have any questions for the panelists today, uh, please don't hesitate to put them in the discussion throughout the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll collate them, get to them after everyone is done speaking. Um, and if you'd like to come on to present your question, uh, we'll be able to bring you on the Zoom. Um, so with, without much further ado, I'm going to open things up with uh, Josh. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you, Luke. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be part of this discussion. I'm looking forward, of course, to hearing what my colleagues have to say and what everybody participating has to say. Um, I'm coming to this as a psychoanalyst, a psychoanalyst who has also written a book about work, um, which in a way might be a good place to start because why does a psychoanalyst write a book about work? There is a certain, I think, notion of clinical psychoanalysis in particular um, as a kind of militantly apolitical haven where what is played out is simply uh, a set of interior dramas, uh, passions and affairs of the heart, which may sometimes involve the intrusion of the outside, of course, in, in terms of the cast of the, the localized cast of characters in the patient's life, and certain terms like work and race and um, <clears throat> uh, and, and capital uh, may float around, but in some classical conception, uh, they will always be representative of something else. And so to write a book about work as a psychoanalyst is to bring in from the outset a kind of third force, which I suppose we might call an objective force, um, like labor. Uh, directly into the consulting room. And part of what motivated me to, to write the book was in a way exactly that, that I was beginning to feel that the very atmosphere, the very conditions of the consulting room were being shaped by an outside force, an external force, that although the consulting room and the session the analytic hour was being used for its classical function. It was also being used for something else um, as a space to actually claim something like a pause or a stop. Um, and that was coming in the context of people, a, a, a massive diversity of people, because um, yes, um, you know, I, I do see some wealthy people in psychoanalysis who have high powered careers and work too hard. I also see um, <clears throat> at a, on a low fee basis, um, people doing precarious work or artists, the very nature of his work is precarious. And so um, I was beginning to see that whoever came really was working under conditions um, which were beginning to take the air out of the room and out of their lives. Um, the, what was being lost from their lives was this essential dimension of human being and human living, which is the dimension of the stop or the pause. Now, sometimes in psychoanalysis, the, the notion of the stop, the moment where activity gives way to inactivity where doing gives way to being 
Sometimes it's been related to uh, the so-called death drive. So the life drive in psychoanalysis is associated with more. Um, sexual reproduction and hard work together are the forces that renew and sustain life, um, that allow for expansion into new territories, into ideas, into communities, technologies. This is what Freud once called the creation of ever larger unities. The life drive is what is expanding human life further and further outwards into ever larger social organizations. Now, what's sometimes called the death drive is that element of inertia that in certain versions of psychoanalysis is opposed to the life drive. So there, if there is something that expands and grows and develops, there is also something that puts a break on expansion that says no. Now, I see this not as an opposition, a kind of Manichaean opposition to the life drive, but actually something that is working inside the life drive. Um, there's an element of inertia, of what Freud in a wonderful phrase called Kregheit in German, which actually translates as kind of sluggishness, dragginess, literally dragginess. Um, and it's the insinuation of a kind of inactivity into the dynamic of expansion. And my favorite example is, is he, you know, he talks about lovers, new lovers. He says new lovers should be the embodiment of a kind of libidinal expansiveness. We should imagine when we see them that you see this this sort of drive to reproduce and to move you know the, the couple's life into ever larger unities the family the community the society and he says somehow actually the libido instead of becoming expansive and open becomes closed and sluggish but all 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 lovers seem to want to do is is kind of get gooey eyed over each other to, to sort of sit in you know anybody who's who's made the mistake of sitting next to a new couple at a party knows this, right? That, that, that they're only interested in each other um, and that they form this sort of cocoon of uh, inertial or sluggish um, uh, hermeticism. So I think that that inertia within expansion or dynamism is something that allows human beings to survive. It actually is an element of living that needs to be acknowledged if we're not to fall into a morass of collective psychopathology. And I think the psychopolitical pathology of our moment is exactly this. It's the denial of this element of sluggishness in the human being as though whatever isn't workable or employable has to be conjured out of existence. Uh, in my other life, um, I, I'm also a, a professor in the humanities, and it seems to me that the attacks on the humanities that we're experiencing at the moment belong to the very same context and the very same psychopathology. Um, that is, we're talking about unemployable activities in more than one sense that are lambasted as a waste of time and money. Um, and the irony in psychoanalytic terms is that the sovereignty of the life drive, the impulsion to expand and to enthrone activity as the highest value has become distinctly deathly. Um, about a hundred, and 50 years ago, at the dawn of, well, not the dawn, in the heart, sorry, of the first age of industrialization, really in, in the course of Freud's youth. So this is the atmosphere in which Freud himself is, um, is coming into maturity. Public health writers like, uh, I mean, the great example is George Beard, the American um, neurologist, um, in the US identifies a first era of burnout which he calls neurasthenia. So 
as Beard sees it in books like American Nervousness, the excitations and anxieties of this new accelerated, hyperstimulated culture of the industrial city um, is resulting in a global epidemic of nervous exhaustion. Um, so he talks about a diffuse proliferation of symptoms, including, this is uh, Beard speaking, debility of all functions, poor appetite, abiding weakness in the back and spine, fugitive neurologic pains, hysteria, insomnia, hypochondriasis, disinclination for consecutive mental labor, severe and weakening attack of sick headache and other analogous symptoms. Um, and there are one or two items on the, that list which in a way are quite extraordinary, the hypochondriasis. Um, so that the um, sort of invented or imagined malaise becomes the actual malaise. It becomes um, one of the concrete symptoms of um, uh, a, a kind of overactive um, culture of labor. Um, the disinclination for consecutive mental labor. In other words, that there is something that breaks up in, in the, the emerging culture of labor, that breaks up the continuity of mental life, that makes it very difficult to move from one proposition to another in a sequential form. That something, in other words, about consciousness is becoming, as we would say, fragmented. Uh, meanwhile, in 2016, um, Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams um, note the emergence of a similar epidemic malaise. Uh, they also are talking about chronic back problems uh, related to the sedentary position this time of the uh, massively expanded white collar uh, workforce, uh, as well as new muscular, skeletal and nervous injuries like RSI. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, and as well as migraine and various sort of generalized uh, phenomena of exhaustion, an entire battery of socio so psychopathologies they write, um, exacerbated under the conditions of neoliberalism, stress, anxiety, depression, as well as famously attention deficiency. So the Beard's list, we can add the various uh, compulsions that have proliferated in the online age, the permanent distraction of social media updates, um, which of course Richard has, Richard has written about so brilliantly, the ever-present instantly accessible uh, <coughs> um, itches of, of gambling, of porn, of um, uh, news feeds, of, of um, uh, shopping, each scratching at the most vulnerable, anxious spots of our inner, inner lives, each exciting us into the promise of transformative gratifications while yielding, yielding only uh, deflating disappointments. In a way, online life is um, an extension of this very enervating culture of overwork. Um, it is now, I think, classic. Uh, at least Karl classic account of the vicissitudes of employment precarity. Ivor Southwood in his 2010 Nonstop Inertia brilliantly captures the permanent innovation of the psyche under the labor conditions of the 21st century. He writes of being under compulsion by the state as the claimant of a job seeker's allowance um, uh, to um, <clears throat> Uh, write up his detailed efforts to find work, showing evidence, he writes, of at least three positive things per week uh, that he's done to um, advance his, uh, his status on the labour market, um, on pain of losing his benefits. So that it's not enough to work, it's not enough to try to find work. Uh, one is quarreled into um, a kind of psychic false uh, a kind of false self position of enforced positive positivity um uh i'm reminded of course here of the brilliant work of barbara ehrenreich but also um of uh 
a program produced for the BBC um, a few years ago uh, on Panorama called the Call Center, um, which began with um, uh, at the assembly of the of the workforce in the call center um, just before putting the headsets on. And the manager of the call center um, said, you know, we don't just come here to work. We come here to have fun. So we're going to start work with a sing song. So they start singing The Killer's Mr. Brightside. And he sort of, you know, really chivies, chivies them up to sing along. Everybody has to sing along. And it looks like, you know, the model of the um, sort of collectively pulling together mutual solidarity of, of a workforce, trying to encourage each other. Um, and then he's interviewed, um, you know, Box Pop afterwards. And he says to camera that um, it's an important exercise, the singing exercise. It gets people into a certain frame of mind. And it's very important that everyone joins in. Unfortunately, there were a couple of people you might have seen in that session who didn't join in and we had to get rid of them. Um, so there is always this threat um, in the culture of enforced optimism of an unspecified punitive measure. Um, it's part of the innovation, I think, of um, uh, of our contemporary labor culture, that we're under both external but also internal compulsion to feel good about how, you know, about how bad we feel. Um, so the persecuting rage also of a political class, which is really something that emerged in the 90s with, with welfare to work programs, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon countries, um, in the Anglophone countries, um, and uh, the media also, the mass media fueling fantasies of idle snowflakes, of malingerers, of wasters and freeloaders seeking easy lives at others' expense. So precarity, I think, becomes above all an experience of a kind of permanent innovation, an uncertainty about the future, not just in sort of broad terms, but at the most immediate level. What am I doing tomorrow? Um, as the um, son of um, uh, um, the, the father of a, of a you know twenty two year old who's joining the workforce, the agencies that that can provide uh, that that they that young people turn to to provide work can one week provide a glut of continuous shifts, morning and night. Um, and then the following week provide nothing at all. So that the future is not something simply that, you know, that can't be planned from year to year. It can't even be envisioned or imagined at the most localized level from week to week. Um, and at the same time, the same predicament um, corrals a young workforce into the culture of the side hustle. Um, the, um, imperative, I think, of, of what psychoanalysis would call the, the kind of the call of the ego ideal. The ego ideal is very different from the superego. The superego says, you have to do this, you must do this. It, it's the work of a sort of, you know, just a nasty boss and fine. At least you know where you are with the superego. This is a kind of Victorian version of persecution. But the persecution of the ego ideal is the persecution of uh, you know, of a friend, of someone who tells you to sing along in the morning, and who says, you can be more, you can do more. Um, the, the sort of friendly, hectoring um, uh, personal trainer who says you can do, you know, one more pull up. Um, this, I think, also contributes to the um, culture of, of, of psychopathology um, under the current conditions of labor. And it's this atmosphere in many different guises that I find increasingly um, haunts my consulting room. So I think I'll leave it there for now and obviously happy to come back on any of these points if, um, if people have questions or points of discussion about that. 
That was really wonderful. Thanks, Josh. Um, up next, we have Sarah. All right, can you hear me? Um, hi, everyone. I have no voice today, or I have like the remnants of a voice. Um, which I can't even claim anything really fun happened. I'm just losing it. I have two cups of tea and a bottle of water. Um, and I'm going to <clears throat> live up to what Josh was just talking about and uh, force myself to do this rather than call in sick because, um, yeah, I am the thing that I write about as in a good little neoliberal subject who is going to show up to work even though she's got a cough and sounds like um, Baba Yaga or something. So here I am enacting the thing that uh, we talk about here. And um, if I'm too obnoxious, I might reserve the right to like answer Q and A questions by typing in the chat rather than talking. But for now, I'm gonna get through as much of my notes here as I can. Um, so I am here because I write about work. I have been asked to do a million interviews about quiet quitting in the last few weeks, which like, we can talk about if we must, but I would prefer not to, um, but, <clears throat> I wrote a book about work not loving you back. Um, and the premise of that book is that the way we work has changed. Under neoliberalism, we are expected to do more work that is more emotionally demanding, that requires you bring more of yourself, not just by the makeup that I put on here to try to make up for the fact that I sound like death warmed over, um, but the smile and the jokes that I'm going to tell to try to get through all of this. Um, these are increasingly requirements. Um, Josh couldn't have set me up better than with that story about singing Mr. Brightside, which, oh my God, of course, that was the song, right? Um, in the workplace, the way that we are expected not just to show up at the call center, not just to be polite to the people whose bills you're canceling or whatever it is that you're doing as a call center worker, but to like it. And if you don't like it, you might be shown the door. Um, this performance of not only doing the job again, and this is where quiet quitting, God, I am going to talk about it, aren't I? This is where this quiet quitting garbage, which you know the labor movement used to call work to rule, comes in. It's the idea that it is somehow equivalent to quitting to only do your job description and not to go above and beyond. That's bonkers, right? That's where we've got to 2022. Um, after two years of pandemic, where a lot of people had a lot worse breathing problems than I do right now, um, where we've gotten to is that it is akin to quitting to not go so far above and beyond that you're singing Mr. Brightside with no voice. Um, so just a little bit to talk about the history of this argument that I'm making before I move on to other fun things about mental health on the job. Um, so I date the shift in this to deindustrialization in the West and the shift in countries like the US, Britain, um, most of Western Europe to a service economy and the knowledge economy that we hear a whole lot about, but most of us really are not actually in. Um, and so when you worked on an assembly line or if you were a coal miner, um, you might have tried to enjoy your job, get along with your colleagues um, because it made being standing behind the same machine for 12 hours a day, less miserable, made being down a hole in the ground less miserable. Um, but it didn't actually matter if you were crying or laughing, if you smiled or you muttered fuck you to everything that went by you on the assembly line, as long as you did the thing that you needed to do. As long as you turned that screw, dug that coal, it didn't matter whether you liked it or not. In fact, a lot of the assembly line workers that I've talked to seem to say that their bosses really tried to go out of their way to make sure they weren't enjoying themselves. Um, and so the shift to work that now requires us to like it, whether that be the call center where like really what they're paying you for is the pretense of a smile, right? A smile when you answer the phone um, because people can hear the smile in your voice, maybe not my voice right now, but somebody's voice. Um, or the genuine caring that's expected of people who do the kinds of caring work that are, again, an increasingly large part of the economy, whether we're talking about doctors, nurses, um, home health care workers, teachers, child care workers, um, the kinds of people who are expected to have genuine care, and that often comes along with demands for genuine self-sacrifice, not just me being too, you know, whatever to quit 
to call off doing a panel tonight, but actually if you don't come to work on this day, then your patients will die kind of pressure, right? So that kind of demand obviously comes with a whole other set of stresses beyond the physical stresses of working on the assembly line, the mind numbing boredom of working on the assembly line a lot of the time, especially if your boss is a jerk and won't let you talk to each other while you're working. Um, the stresses of having to squash down your own feelings, whatever they might be, in order to put on that smile, um, which, sorry, which Arlie Russell Hochschild famously called emotional labor, um, that's a lot of work. It's hard and it is potentially sort of psychologically damaging if you have to do it for too long and you don't get the kinds of pauses and breaks that Josh was talking about to actually go, wait a minute, what do I feel? Who am I actually when I don't have to put that smile on my face? Um, that kind of break from work that just doesn't come very often. Um, this is a different kind of stress. And so we get, um, in this moment, we get discussions of a different kind of stress, right? We get conversations about burnout, um, which I realized when I was going through my notes on an article I'd written about this, that um, I was reviewing Anne Helen Peterson's book and actually I'm pretty sure she's quoting this Josh Cohen talking about burnout. Um, so that's great. I have, I have Josh in my notes. Um, Burnout, the diagnosis dates back to the 70s, and it, it dates back to research on caring workers, on doctors, nurses, um, who are expected, again, to be self-sacrificing, um, have high pressure, and maybe even had high pay, right? If we're talking about doctors, they're pretty well paid. These are pretty secure professions. Um, in the U.S., doctors are probably more higher paid than they are here, but, you know, um, and are expected to come with intrinsic motivation for their work, the same way that I have intrinsic motivation to show up here and talk to you, even though I can't really talk properly. Um, and that burnout was not just stress and it was not just exhaustion, the kind of exhaustion that you might have if you're working in a coal mine, which is to say a lot of exhaustion, but it is the loss of that intrinsic motivation for your work that was such a key point in burnout. And that is such a key point, I think, in the discussions of burnout that we're having these days, because it's a problem of the era of the labor of love, right? It's a problem of work that you might have some intrinsic motivation for. You probably don't have that much intrinsic motivation for the call center, no matter how much that dude makes you sing Mr. Brightside. You maybe do um, if you're, um, working in a restaurant, say I worked in a restaurant, some of them were okay places to work, but I remember going on a job interview to a little sushi restaurant in Denver, Colorado. And this was, I was just out of university and I didn't know what the hell I was doing with my life. And the manager is just like, very seriously, where do you see yourself in five years? And I was like, dude, it's a sushi restaurant. You're gonna pay me $2 and 13 cents an hour, which is the tips minimum wage in the US. And by the way, still is, and that was 20 years ago. Um, you don't get to know where I'm going to be in five years. I tell you, I'm sure as hell not going to be there. Um, it was as far away from Denver as I could get, actually, but that's another story. Um, that expectation, right, of that intrinsic motivation for me to sell sushi to yuppies in Denver. Yeah, whatever. But if you were a nurse, you probably didn't go into nursing for the money. It's a decently paid job, right? But it's also incredibly stressful and difficult. And that is something that requires some desire to help people for a living, right? To be a doctor, um, I guess, you know, in the US, again, you can be like a plastic surgeon and make $300,000 a year or something like that. But like, you probably went to medical school, which is a whole lot of work and deferred um, your gratification, say, because you had some desire to be in this kind of profession that does things for people. And losing that, is a sort of key element of this idea of burnout that we talk about so much these days. Um, but these, these histories, as Josh was saying, um, are older, right? There's neurasthenia, there's um, the word stress itself, which in Will Davies' book, The Happiness Industry, he points out that before the 1940s was mostly used to apply to metals, not human bodies, um, but it then, comes to apply to us. We break if we work too much and don't get a rest. Um, our bodies break and our minds break. Um, you get heart disease, you get all sorts of other fun things if you're stressed out. And one of the things that is the most stressful on the job is a lack of autonomy, lack of recognition, a lack of control. 
So the more you have some sort of say over the conditions of your work, the better your dealing with stress may, is likely to be. So I can just say this in my own life. I'm a freelancer, which I hate because I'm constantly chasing money. But I also prefer it to having a real job because I get to mostly decide how my days are run. As long as I turn in the article on deadline, I don't, nobody is looking over my shoulder. Nobody's installed a keystroke logger on my computer that I know of anyway. Um, I bought this one myself, so probably not. Um, that kind of question of power in the workplace, again, I think is incredibly important for understanding why people are burned out and stressed now because the world of work has been getting worse and we're seeing these pressures on the kinds of work that might have you know, had some autonomy before. The attack on the humanities that Josh is talking about, the sort of proletarianization of professors um, is taking away a lot of the autonomy that you might have expected to have if you went to academia a few years ago, um, a few decades ago, maybe, right? The destruction of systems of tenure, um, the casualization of these jobs that used to be a full-time good job. Stanley Aronowitz, Stanley Aronowitz famously called it the last good job in America being a college professor. Now 75% of the professors in America are part-time adjunct faculty. Um, this is taking away that control and autonomy that was a big reason why people got into those jobs as well as whatever intrinsic motivation they had for the work that they did. So we're all stressed, we're all burned out, we're all exhausted. Um, then what happens? Oh, then we get a two year freaking global pandemic um, in which I did a lot of interviews with workers, especially in the early days when we had nothing to do but be on Zoom anyway. I was sort of going, okay, what can I do to be useful? I can talk to people about how their work lives have changed and just do a ton of interviews and publish a bunch of stuff because that is felt important to me. And I think um, it was to get a sense of how the world of work was changing. And that um, the story that I heard over and over and over again, right? It's just like everybody's job, pretty much, unless you're Jeff Bezos, had gotten more miserable, right? If you were a professor, you're teaching on Zoom, all of a sudden you can't see people's faces the same way I can't see your faces and tell if I'm boring the crap out of you right now, or if you're really tired of listening to my old hag voice. Um, you, if you're a journalist, I was doing interviews over Zoom. I was doing everything from the you know confines of my own room rather than having the fun of going out to picket lines and fun things that I do when I'm being a journalist in the world when I can actually meet people. Um, you didn't get to, you know, the, the thing that depresses me about these Zoom panels actually is I would love to like, after we click off the Zoom to like go have a drink with all of you, put some whiskey on my tired voice and like chat more, right? Um, I've met Richard. I've never met the other two folks here. It'd be great to hang out. Can't do that. You just sort of get clicked off and you're alone. Um, and in deep pandemic, that was really miserable. But then that's, that's those of us who are lucky, right? Enough to be able to work from home. For a lot of people who couldn't work from home, who were still doing the exact same job they'd been doing before, but now it was a whole lot more likely to kill them, right? Whether you're a bus driver, whether you're a nurse, whether you're... Um, any number of when you know you're a grocery store clerk, um, you're working in the ports, you're working in an Amazon warehouse, um, your work just got a whole lot worse because you got to stay 10 feet away from everybody else. You're wearing a mask, maybe if you're lucky enough to get a mask from your boss, um, and you don't know that you're going to get this thing if you're going to get this thing every day and bring it home and you know kill your kids. Um, I spoke to an Amazon worker from Minneapolis. His name is Mohammed Meyer. And he was telling me, you know, when he goes home from work at the, after the warehouse, his little girl comes running up to him when he gets home, daddy, daddy, daddy. And she's, he's like, no, I have to tell her to stay away from me until I've gone and showered and like washed everything and changed my clothes so that I can like touch her and not be worried that I'm going to bring something home to her. You know, um, the stresses of all of that um, on top of, again, these not being great jobs to begin with. Um, and it really was true that a lot of the jobs that were already the worst were also the most likely to give you COVID working in like meatpacking plants were just workers were just devastated with the pandemic, right? Because like those places don't have good protections at the best of time. And again, yes, something, something America joke about chlorinated chicken. Yes, I get it. But even in this country, I promise you, they're not nice places to work. Um, and so what happens after two years of realizing that your boss doesn't care if you die? Um, well, I mean, strike waves, which is great, right? We're in a moment where we're seeing a lot of anger. 
what um, my friend Mark Brenner, who used to work at Labor Notes, called PTSD strikes on the part of nurses. Um, we've had a lot of nurses strikes in the States. You're gearing up for an RCN strike vote here in this country. They've been hiring organizers, um, the RMT strikes, the, the port workers, eight day port workers strike at Felix Stowe. Um, these are the essential workers, right? These are the people who are still going during the pandemic and are now saying, um, as the campaign slogan goes, enough is enough. So that's great, right? I'm, the worker action part is the great part of the story. It's exciting. People are pissed. People are winning some things. Um, and people are making demands that maybe they hadn't made in a long time, in part because some of this veil of the love your job and your job loves you back is gone now, right? When you realize that your boss really doesn't care too much if you die, as long as the company keeps moving, profits keep going. Um, workers at, ugh, I can't remember which one it was because there were three food processing plant strikes in the States in a row. It was Frito-Lay, Nobisco, and Kellogg. So all these, you know, brand name processed foods. One of the plants had a story of a worker dying on the assembly line and just getting sort of yanked out of the way. And I've heard versions of that story again, many times through my life. Um, as a labor journalist. So that's the positive side of it, right? Is that the, the collective action that can come of it. But even if collective action is coming of it, we are we're dealing with a lot. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up sooner than 20 minutes because like my voice sounds terrible. But um, I wanted to, to return to what Josh was talking about, the idea of the pause. Um, because my new project that I'm working on is a book about grief, um, which is obviously inspired by the pandemic. It's inspired by some of my own um, experiences. And it is an argument that like on some level, grief is a thing that capitalism has a very hard time metabolizing, that it can do a great job with our happiness. It can sell us all sorts of things to make us happy. Um, and it can bully you into being happy on the job or it can try to anyway. But what it can't really do, I mean, A, what it can't really do is place value on human lives, which is what grieving is, right? Grieving is an expression of our interconnectedness. It's an expression of the fact that we value other people's lives, um, which is a thing that just like by its very nature, capitalism really can't do. Um, and the other thing is that grief rather than work, and this is where I, I you know, quibble with Freud, but you know, I think he changes mind later too. Like grieving is not work. It's not a process you can be good at. I know when my father died, I, I thought it was a great idea. I was just going to be, I was going to be really good at grieving. I was going to go to therapy. I was going to work on it. And I was going to like be good at this. No way in hell. I'm still messed up. It's four years later. Um, and that this, this idea of the pause being taken away from us um, is something that grief can bring back into the conversation that talking about grieving um, can be a way to demand that space to deal with all of the things that have happened, all of the incredible trauma of the last couple of years, um, all of the loss, right? The US over a million people died of COVID. That's bonkers. And, you know, they killed 3,000 people in the Twin Towers attacks, and we started two forever wars that still aren't over. Um, and a million people die of COVID, and we say shrug and get back to work. So I think. To talk about grief in this moment is to make space for all of these issues that we are just not dealing with. Um, and yeah, I, I wanna close with one last story for some, from a couple of workers that I spoke to earlier this year um, who worked at a warehouse in New Jersey that had been one of those rare warehouse jobs where people had stayed there for like 20 years. And these two workers um, were there when several of their coworkers got sick. One of their coworkers died, then another one of their coworkers died. They were not given time off. They were not given any sort of breaks, any acknowledgement even that people had died. And finally, they said, you know, again, enough and stopped work. Um, they were threatened with deportation. A lot of them were undocumented immigrants. And the thing that they did to sort of dramatize this was they ended up holding as a protest, a big public funeral and a march for the people that had died to really bring home that like this is something we need time to grieve and we need to take seriously. Um, and I will stop there with my terrible voice.
Well, thanks so much, Sarah, um, for having been a, a bad slacker and uh, persisted through the, uh, the illness to come and talk with us today. Um, next up is uh, Richard, if you want to take it away. Sure. OK, so <clears throat> uh, let me start with the unspeakable, one of my favorite subjects. There is, as Simon Charlesworth puts it in his phenomenology of working class experience, a vulnerability bound inarticulateness in class life. Andrew Sayer, writing on the moral significance of class, describes a mute, low level shame just below the threshold of articulacy. Diane Ray, in her study of working class schoolgirls, finds a dread of amounting, in the words of one student, to literally nothing. Working class women, Beverly Skeggs finds, often reject the identification with their class, fearing that it labels them as vulgar and socially unacceptable. This is class shame, but it cannot be acknowledged as such because we're ashamed of being ashamed. Um, one form of repression is to detach the thought from the affect that it produces. So you still have the thought, but you can dismiss it. And the feeling, the mute sense of shame lingers. So that you mitigate your existence around class superiors with exaggerated apologetic niceness, the silent invisibility of the cleaning workers. You come over uneasy with a prickly hot sweat in a fancy shop. You assume that this is all a personal inadequacy because it is felt as a personal inadequacy. And you try to put it away, move on, be optimistic, find hope. But says Charlesworth, the future is inaccessible to those under 40. And he was writing in 2000, over two decades ago. The world they inhabit, he finds, is fractured no longer supported by a steady stream of habitual associations and their personal affective world is pre-constituted as chaotic, absurd. Hope is found not in the fabric of an ever more precarious life building, but in commodity form from self-help to palingenetic nationalism. So work, um, I mean to indicate by starting off with these, uh, ruminations on class shame doesn't stop at the workplace, doesn't even begin at the workplace. Um, in as much as the workplace is the locus of life building and what we call our dreams, and of course of the shattering existential experiences of class. And I wanted to try to concretize this in a way. Um, and actually what I'm about to say resonates with what uh, Josh and Sarah have both said. Allow me to represent to you myself at the age of 25. So I would graduated at that stage from zero hours call center work, which was very much along the lines of the assembly line, to the point that um, your toilet breaks were timed, um, to a more regular nine to five thirty job in a market research office. And the work itself, though relentlessly tedious, wasn't actually the exhausting thing about it. Actually far worse were those prolonged periods of having nothing to do because you've done all the tasks and you have to invent new ones to avoid being assigned something even more demeaning and hateful because you can't just go home. For what it's worth, by the way, I filled this time by stealing company internet to blog. And if you don't know what blogging is, ask your dad. The office politics, junior managers who become a pain in the arse because you haven't flattered them or have tried too hard or in some way give the impression of being a smart arse or uppity or thinking you're too good for the job, which how could you not be too good for the job? The email exchanges with other departments who want to blame you for their problems or get you to do their work or offload their misery in the spirit of existential revenge. The productivity meetings with department heads or managers where if you're as sophisticated and worldly as I was, slightly less so than Babbitt of Zenith USA, you're amazed to find that it's the bosses who seem most down to earth and human who talk to you, who single you out for particular humiliation over the most trivial of complaints. Those same managers, to your further astonishment, flirt with you in after work socials. The desolating rituals of fun, as has been mentioned, Cake Tuesday, Dress Down Friday, because Friday is fun day. 
capitalism, having monopolized the best of the day, the glorious daylight hours, insists that you have fun. The dead zone of zombie labor, a separate time stream, a slow, agonizing current that registers change only by the occasional awareness that it's getting darker outside and the best of the day is slipping away. The bleeding of that dead zone into free time, flexibility as though your willingness to do extra work is a fun fact about your personality. The commute in crowded trains and buses, the time it takes to unwind, to let go of whatever it was that had you crying in the toilet, and the strange guilt that you feel when you're ill and take a day off, Sarah, and no one to stick up for you. Strikes are about as fashionable as shoulder pads, and when you naively ask if there's a union, they stiffly reply, we have no interest in a union. They could be hardly more provoked if you give them a stiff finger up the Celtic end. And the worst is the dawning interminability of it. It will never stop. It will only pause for holidays. It's what you've been destined for by an accident of birth, a, a chance swerve of the atom, and there's nothing to build with. The money is better than the minimum wage, but not enough to rent more than a single room in a London house. Where is all this going anyway? What was the dream? And though you wore a suit to the first week at work, you're now constantly late because you're resisting passively. And a depression that you barely perceive, let alone understand, is consoled with McDonald's breakfast food in the morning and booze at night, and you're growing blotchy, skinned, and pudgy and unfit, and you reek of unhappiness. And every now and then, something reminds you of how little the world thinks of you. Your bank abruptly cancels your overdraft just a day before your pay was due in. They claim they've tried to contact you about it, and they take it all. Your student loans company takes a payment. They claim they sent you the deferment forms. They take a third of your disposable income for the month. Or a bill comes that you just weren't expecting. And it's worse because you should have known. It's all your own stupid fault. And now you have nothing to play with, nothing to have fun with for the rest of the month. And when you try to negotiate with them, the bank, the student loans company, whoever, they scold you. Their instant class evaluations, which are moral evaluations, permit them to humiliate you in petty ways. And you should manage your money better. But the thing is, when you're working at that level, money can be fleeting. They tell you to save, for what? If you saved your whole life, you might get a mortgage for a dump in Plumstead, no offense, or they say, defer gratification. But you've been doing that the whole month until payday, your whole life is an exercise in perpetually deferred gratification. There's nothing coming except more work, more debt, and more of those fight or flight shocks. There is no future, so you may as well enjoy it now. Besides, we're talking about me still here. You're a young working class man. You have no idea how to take care of yourself. You wear shit, cheap shit that falls apart in a couple of months and needs to be replaced with more cheap shit. You don't understand fashion and its obscure sexual charisma. You resent those who do and anyway, it's too expensive. You eat shit because you don't know how to cook and you have no motivation to find out. You live in shit because tidying a small rented room hardly seems worth the effort. You eat shit, you wear shit, you live in shit, you're drinking your body to shit, you're treated like shit, you are shit. Failure in the neoliberal culture whose axioms of competition and conditions of optimal stupidity are they're all out to get me and nothing makes sense is toxic. Failure is always difficult, but it's now toxic. And in conditions in which the means of life are increasingly black boxed to increase dependency and suggestibility, we are increasingly deprived of control over whether we succeed or fail, such control as we ever had. Hence the fear that young people have increasingly of adulting, hence blackpilling, that whirlpool of reactive emotions that culminates in a desire for suicide revenge on the world. So this is one story of one point in one working life characterized by absurdity, cluelessness, disorientation, stupidity, frankly, in which the only predictability is more work. And by telling you all this, I mean to show something like the density of experience in which, as I say, work doesn't stop or begin at the workplace, not simply because of our free after hours labor, but because of the work in the Freudian sense that it has us doing, the work in our ex instinctual excitations, which must be suitably sublimated and organized around the working day uh, to keep things going interminably. The belaboring of the self, 
when Freud wrote on civilization and its discontents, the burdens that civilization imposed on drive satisfactions, he didn't really have much to say work about work uh, in the sort of capital sense, but it really is one of the major sources of mental suffering today. And when we talk about workplace stress, we're talking in part of psychosocial stress, not just, you know, I've got so much work to do. One of the Bartesian mythologies of workplace stress is that it particularly afflicts busy executives. You've seen the imagery, no doubt. Um, you could just do a Google search for it. It's invariably a man in an expensive suit or a woman in an expensive suit at an office desk in front of a PC, pinching the nose, lowering the face into the hands, wiping the brow, doing anything with the hands but working. It's so unproductive. And the Whitehall study showed us the exact opposite of this myth. The lower in the chain of authority you are, the less assertive you are, the less you take control of conversations, the less clearly you articulate, the higher your rate of stress, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. The fight or flight responses triggered by the petty injustices are cumulatively deadly, weakening your immune system, enlarging, enlarging your adrenal gland, cutting your life expectancy. And then there's the damage done by self-medicating for those class injuries, barely understood as such often perceived more as a fatal form of moral non-recognition, which result in the famous deaths of despair. You're not just stressed, you're an orphan of history. And that's why mental illness is being politicized far more effectively by the right, even as it's depoliticized by Mac mindfulness, CBT and other assorted panaceas. The resentment bred by class experience can be incredibly dangerous. It can be a demoralizing, self-destructive emotion. It has been said that resentment is like swallowing poison and waiting for the other chap to die. As Max Shaler wrote in his class study, Resentment, this sort of resentment doesn't seek restitution precisely because it is enthralled by its powerlessness and the growing pleasure afforded by invective and negation. It can also lead to explosions of violence, what Lacanians would call a passage to the act. Because let's not forget that the lone wolf contagion began with a spate of workplace shootings. It was called going postal. When the most miserably oppressed and bullied members of the workforce got hold of a gun and went on the rampage, often singling out managers responsible for their petty humiliations and often inducing a surprising sympathy among their co-workers, the survivors. It can also be profoundly reactionary. Just think about uh, the shopkeeper's talk described by Karen Wells and Sophie Watson. The idle pleasure taken in berating asylum seekers, minorities and big corporations. The consolation of moaning without solution. Think of the resentment from metropolitan elites and the middle classes in far off London. Thomas Gorman's field work on class resentment mainly finds working class resentment directed at members of the middle class by whom they feel patronized or belittled or at an unfair disadvantage. Because while the mechanisms of class injury are abstract, and we must talk seriously about the violence of abstraction, the ruling class is remote from daily life, but the middle class is experienced directly as a supervisory, professional, or managerial layer wielding authority. And you can think about this in all sorts of uh, contexts and axes. You know, it's not just class, the way you know, we talk about intersections, uh, the intersection of class, gender, and race. You think about what it's like to compete with other groups of workers in these conditions and the ways in which class resentment can bleed into sexism, racism, and uh, other toxic emotions. At least this might help explain why the rich can be so resented as a recent analysis of class attitudes suggests that they are. E yet reactionaries find it laughably easy to stimulate resentment against liberal professionals and left-wing students aspiring to be liberal professionals as if they were the elite. You, we can't bypass these emotions that arise from the grind of class experience. The strategic question is how to selectively provoke resentment, bring it to consciousness, or rather bring shame to consciousness and transform it into resentment. And from there, educated in the direction of a more sober, slow burning, impersonal class hate, one that's patient, rigorous, humane, strangely pluralist and anti-Manichaean and constructive. 
it's hard to think of how that could be enacted, except that we do have some examples in uh, the Don't Pay campaign, the strikes, the Enough is Enough campaign. But I think recently of how Bernie Sanders campaigns in the United States, linking resentment towards billionaires and the rich with demands for decent things like Medicare or a $15 minimum wage. And to be honest, I contrast it ruefully with the priestly pieties of the politics of kindness and they go low, we go high. Not that kindness and the high road are undesirable here and not that we could or should imitate the right's relentless nihilistic war on decency and truth not that we should allow them um, to you know um, claim the terrain but we have to start with the dark materials the labor of the negative if we are to get there um, that's all i have to say for now thank you Thank you so much for that, Richard. Um, if any of you all had any thoughts or questions for your fellow panelists, uh, I wanted to give priority to those. Um, <clears throat> I, I uh feel bad about working your voice any further, Sarah. So if you do want to reply in the chat, that is absolutely fine. But I, I would really, I, I was so intrigued um, by the project you announced at the end on, on grief that I would like to hear more about that and particularly um, more about um, what you were beginning to formulate as a kind of labor of grief. Um, an unending, melancholic labor of grief. Let's see, how, how, how do I sound? Do I sound okay? We'll see if I can do this. Um, yeah, I feel like I should be asking you questions because I'm not a psychoanalyst and I, I should probably talk more to some while I'm thinking about this stuff. But um, so yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book about grief and politics and the world. And um, it is centered around five issues that are sort of at the center of everything these days. Um, so it's Black Lives Matter, white supremacy, um, immigration, deindustrialization, COVID and climate, which sort of obviously comes last because it's kind of everything. Um, and I think that the experience of you know, losing a family member in a way that was both sort of predictable and, and very much not predictable and managed to completely upend my life um, to the point where I spend a half of my time in a different country than the one that I used to live in um, is a, um, it made me see grief everywhere. And also to, again, sort of realize the way that um, talking about grief as a form of work was not useful and that actually um, our tendency to turn everything into a discussion about work, um, I think is, is itself an example of the thing you were talking about, which is um, the, the way that work has colonized all of the things that were that allowed us to stop, to pause, to um, just be a human. One of the things that um, I think has made all these issues so very hard to deal with is that we are constantly moving at a rate that um, doesn't allow us to think about it. Um, and so, yeah, I think not wanting to stray too far from the, the subject matter at hand here, um, that thinking about all of the things that we are not allowed to do because they are not productive, um, we're even doing is like, is too active a word mm -hmm. for that. Um, I interviewed uh, the novelist Namwale Serpil the other day for book forum about a beautiful new book that she's written that's about grief. And she's telling me about an essay that is now behind an academic paywall, so I don't have access to it. So if anybody wants to help me, um, get at your girl, um, about drift 
and the idea of things that are neither sort of doing nor being done to, but some other register of happening. Um, so now I really need to look up this essay because I'm really intrigued by this concept. But yeah, so what does it mean to try to conceptualize things that aren't work? Um, and to try to see some of those things back from these paradigms of work that have taken them all over. Um, I was struck by what you were saying about love and it, you know, driving us to sort of sluggishness, like the, you know, the best thing to do when you meet someone new is just like stay in bed half the day. It's the greatest, right? Um, can you tell I wanted a good date recently? Um, so like, <laughs> that, but yeah, that like work is even creeping into that, right? Like if, the dating apps, which I've deleted entirely and just refuse to engage with anymore because they just make going on a date feel like a job interview. Um, and like, no, I just don't want like the labor of swiping. Either I will meet people in the real world or I will die single, which is fine with me. Um, because I just don't want to let these logics of work take over everything. Um, and, you know, I end up sort of chewing on Walter Benjamin's definition of revolution as, as humanity reaching for the emergency break. So um, I actually had a question I wanted to pose uh, a couple of you, in particular Josh and Sarah. Um, I was really taken by the way that art showed up in both of your works as a kind of uh, at this overt rejection of art as a sort of implicit model for work. Um, it's kind of a, a, a trope in a Marxist, um, socialist, utopian writings on work to pose uh, art as a kind of paradigm for autotelic labor. Um, what, 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 la what labor, what work could be uh, liberated from uh, production for value, a particular kind of instrumentality. Um, but both of your work seems to reject this or, or at least um, bracket it in a, in a kind of particular way. Uh, Sarah, uh, I, I know you present art as a type of work rather than just, you know, rather than uh, purely presenting art as this paradigm for work. Um, you do sociological analysis to, to an extent of the labor conditions of contemporary art. And um, Josh, uh, I know you frame the uniqueness of art uh, with regard to its capacity for pause. Um, it, it's inhabiting potentially a, a kind of sabbatical dimension. Uh, and the place where this led, um, which I'm really curious about because I think it, it frames the panel in a sort of broader sense is, is whether any of you all see any hope for the reformation of labor processes, labor conditions towards making something like work uh, in a broad sense, something we might do for its own sake, uh, something we might do which, which provides us with, with something besides uh, wages for, for labor power sold. Um, and and uh, I'm interested in, in how you all might want to frame the answer to this question in broad strokes, because I think it, it also implicitly uh, frames the question of, of where we want to go from these sociological findings politically, um, whether we want to uh, move towards uh, something like universal basic income, which I know all three of you have offered maybe tentative words of support for at some point in your work, um, versus whether some sort of uh, wholesale transformation of, of what work is, how work works, uh, whether this is something which is desirable, uh, feasible, or whether it just collapses into, uh, as, as Josh put it, um, work is as kind of uh, this, this demand put upon us by the ego ideal um, that we can't ever really escape from. Wow. Um, I mean, maybe I could just start by taking us back to the um, sort of heroic revolutionary mode of uh, autotelic art. 
art as the horizon of unalienated labor. Um, and I think that history in a way has exhausted that model. The notion that that um, there could be uh, a mode of art, which was in, in, in the sense of Aaron's distinction, work, but not labor. Um, in other words, it birthed for something new into the world, but without the strain and the tedium, um, uh, the grind of labor. Um, I think the, the difficulty of that is that all those rhetorics um, have been co-opted and worked into um, the current cultural work. And so you can now go to sort of um, workplace seminars, which um, sort of happily incorporate into a corporate context something like a spiritual dimension, um, you know, mindfulness, as Richard was saying, um, and where, if you like, there is a kind of paradised version of the utopian horizon in which you have a sort of farcical repetition of the autotelic horizon, which is now sort of, um, you know, loving work for its own sake because um you know you're you're just so happy to be able to make your contribution um and uh to be part of this this sort of this family of the bank or the um the factory um uh or the, the call center um and so i think that what was missing from those revolutionary discourses of of art as as work actually is Slack, but slack as excess, slack as something, some element of gratuitousness, because what happens with the sort of autotelic ideal is that actually it produces a work that coincides, if you like, with the time available. It's a, it's a kind of maximally aesthetically harmonious use of time, a, a kind of a harmony between time and work that is almost perfect. And so there's no, there's, there's sort of, there's not, not, no excess, nothing wasted, nothing that you didn't want to do there. So what's filtered out is the hostility we feel. And this is what Richard, I think, was gesturing towards the end of his talk, the, the, the hostility that is intrinsic to the work process itself. And so in a way, I'm more interested. I, I think that what interested me so much about grief um, and, and Sarah's sort of, you know, initial formulation insight that neoliberalism cannot, in a way, cannot acknowledge that such a thing as grief exists. And the reason it can't is because um, grief, if it is anything at all, is excess, is gratuitous, right? There is, there, there is nothing about grief that stays within bounds. And in fact, if it does, it isn't grief. It's something else. It's feeling a little sad about something. But the thing that, that I think scares people senseless about their own grief and about somebody else's grief is that it makes a mockery of all the structures and mechanisms that we try to use to keep people within bounds of time, within bounds of, of sort of sensible frameworks for self-expression, uh, for, for, for representation of their own inner states. And um, I, I, I suspect Sarah was talking about this when she talked about the, the, the uh, book more widely, but I, I think that something like that, like that confrontation um, of a kind of excess in the human being, um, uh, a confrontation of capital with um, a kind of fundamental and irreducible excess in the human being. I think that that's that's the kind of horizon that I'm I would look to want to look towards here. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Josh. That was great. Um, the thing that I would add, um, so just in terms of in my book, um, the 
I basically argue that the um, this idea of the labor of love comes from two places. It comes from our ideals of care work and our ideals of gendered work in particular, right? That caring is something that women are naturally good at and like biologically predisposed to. Um, apparently there's a new book about um, how the maternal instinct is bullshit that just came out that I'm gonna have to read a little too late for me for research, but still. Um, and on the other side, it was this idea of the artist as unalienated labor. And it like, it would be really nice. And, you know, I've read my William Morris. I actually have a William Morris print blazer that I wear to some of these talks sometimes just to be fun. But um, the thing about that is you can only be the unalienated laborer if you do not have to sell your labor in order to survive. So who gets to be the unalienated artist under capitalism um, is somebody who is already wealthy, right? Um, and in writing about this, one of the things that was the most sort of interesting and frustrating to me was how little, even by like Marxist art critics, like how little like somebody like John Berger wrote about the process of making art, about the work of making art. Um, it's actually really, really underwritten about subject um, because I think everybody, even again, somebody as brilliant and Marxist and an art critic as John Berger, um, still does have this idea that we want to believe that that art can be that unalienated labor. And I just would say that it can't be um, without getting rid of capitalism. And that nothing, we can't get beyond this sort of framework for work. All it will be will be life hacks. Like I choose to be a freelancer rather than take some of the jobs that I've been offered in the last few years, because it is to me a slightly less alienated form of labor than being a hot take artist who has to write three columns a week on whatever it is that somebody wants to pay me, you know, reasonable amount. The last time somebody tried to hire me directly, they offered me a pretty good amount of money and I still wouldn't take it because that sounded like hell to me. And I can make that choice because I'm 42 years old. I'm single. I don't have kids and don't want them. And I've been doing this for long enough and have written two fairly successful books. I can't, that's not like a replicable strategy for dealing with the world be me is not like a good answer. I think other people should have children. I would just be very bad at it. Um, but, you know, I think um, privatized child rearing is a whole other thing we can get into for about three hours. But like, you know, until we actually have like a real wholesale change in the way that we organize the world, um, it's just going to be sort of life hacks. It's going to be strategies for getting through life. And I think um, psychoanalysis and other forms of therapy are incredibly important. Um, God bless my therapist. I would not have made it through the last four years, certainly without her. But to actually think about um, how we deal with these problems of work is dealing with the fact that capitalism is based on wage labor and wage labor is fundamentally unfree. I, I really appreciated uh, both of your answers to that to that somewhat somewhat sprawling question. Um, I yeah, uh, I, I'm going to share a question for Richard uh, from the chat. Um, so an anonymous an anonymous watcher uh, asked, uh, Richard, does class resentment really help in long term as in revolutionizing ways? It surely transforms shame, but feels like it misses some points. A worker organizer once told a worker that to resent the upper class, but not a society that is built with classes will drain you eventually. What are your suggestions on class resentment to make it further reaching than a mere eat the rich narrative? Thank you. Your speech was almost like poetry. And, and I concur with the, the last remark from uh, the questioner. Um, thank you. Um, uh... I agree. I mean, I basically don't want to come across as uh, validating resentment. I'm really suspicious of all reactive emotions. And I'm really suspicious of the way in which resentment has become a driving force of politics. I mean, uh, you know, there's always a sense in which uh, you overstate the novelty of this. Um, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, I've written about social media and the sort of resentment machine uh, that uh, Twitter is, but like, we had that with the tabloids, you know, there, there's always uh, going to be this machinery there, but I think it has become problematically implicated with everyday life, you know, with everyday communication, with social life, uh, in a much more direct way. 
Um, and so I, I think uh, anything we can do to um, undercut uh, the attachment to resentment, particularly the attachment to enthrallment, to powerlessness, to whining and complaining without actually having any solutions or getting anything done, uh, great. But the point that I'm making is you can't get anywhere unless you start by um, bringing the shame to consciousness. I mean, because I think class shame is a real thing. Um, and I think that um, I know it from my own life, you know, like uh, if I go into one of these fancy clothes shops, for example, I feel like everything about the place is screaming at me to get the fuck out. You know, you do not belong here. Um, and I'm 45. You know, I can handle going into a clothes shop, but the uh, semiotics still make me feel really uneasy. Um, and uh, I know that that was the case for uh, my father as well. Um, so um, I think that um, class shame, uh, you know, manifests in the workplace and manifests beyond the workplace. And unless it turns into a recognition of an injustice, and it's not necessarily the injustice that you think it is, like the person on the spot, like the, you know, to take an example, your uh, supervisor might not be the one really to blame. Uh, your, uh, the person that's uh, being a bit condescending to you in the shop might not be worth getting all messed up about. But unless you recognize there's something kind of unjust going on here and start to figure it out, you, you're not going to get anywhere. So we have to move through resentment. It's just a very bad place to get stuck. Um, and so uh, uh, also just uh, can I just add one thing about the previous discussion? I'm very uh, wary of, um, I guess, because I'm so uh, obsessed with the tragic dimensions of life. Um, I'm wary of any idea that we're ever going to get a non alienated form of labor. Um, uh, and, or at least I'm wary of the idea that overthrowing capitalism would get uh, get us past alienated labor. I think that, um, you know, there are always going to be tasks um, uh, uh, that you don't want to do. And there are always going to be burdens that uh, you didn't ask for um, and that society needs of you. In other words, this is where civilization and its discontents has a point. Uh, civilization exact, exacts a toll. It costs something. Um, and so I, I think that the question is how to make it manageable. How much can we bear? And it turns out from all research that I can find out about this, and I, I, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert on the subject, but as far as I can see, it turns out that what really hurts about alienated labor, as we call it, is the, is the injustice of it, the inequality of it, the fact that there are so many other people um, who uh, are spared while we have to do an un unfair amount of work. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, it's not for our benefit, really, ultimately, this is for somebody else's benefit. And the fact that I suppose, you know, if you work in a, a workplace that's slowly poisoning you, or if you happen to be aware that you're slowly poisoning the environment around you, and that it's not really for your benefit, you know, those are sources of uh, resentment that are actually toxic, they're lethal. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, maybe there's a case for a kind of... Um, a minimum utopia where we uh, accede to a, a minimum amount of necessary alienated labor. Anyway, that's beside the point. I would just say that I don't think alienated labor is just work that we don't like that is unpleasant, though it is actually the condition of not being able to control the products of your own labor, right? To be, um, there's a difference. I just finished reading a book that is not out yet, Emily Kenway's forthcoming book on care work, which is specifically about being a family caregiver and the late, the needs of family caregivers um, who are not being paid in the most part, right? And who are doing this out of some form of care. And also the work is still unendingly miserable, it involves a lot of grief um, and is very difficult, but it's different than the work of somebody who is hired from the outside to do that work. Um, even if that person too has a lot of genuine care, right? When I've talked to nannies and home care workers who are told they're part of the family and expected to expend a very real amount of love and care on the people that they care for, whether they be elderly, sick people, um, children. And then at some point they're just unceremoniously booted out of the family, you know? 
Um, this woman that I spoke to who was a home care worker during COVID was caring for a hundred year old woman. They both got COVID. Deb, the worker who is 60 years old herself, moves in with her hundred year old client, stays with her as they both recover from COVID. And then this woman's family just takes the woman and moves her to California. Bye bye, Deb. You know, and that is what it means to be an alienated labor in that in that field, um, which is different than if I was taking care of my sick mother. I, I appreciate um, Richard and Sarah uh, for having sharpened a particular edge of the, the question I, I was asking a bit ago, because really implicitly, I think the frame was, uh, you know, when I when I said something to the effect of a, a transformation uh, of of what what labor was consisted of, um, without being overly programmatic, I think the the ramifications were basically you know a, a, imagining something like um, abolishing generalized commodity production or what have you, right? Rather than um, stronger labor laws or or, or this or that. Um, but actually, uh, I I think. What uh, the place where Sarah took the discussion in in her last uh, response, I think, is really interesting um, because we we've heard uh, you know suggestions now that that on the one hand, um, alienated labor is something that persists regardless of uh, wage payment that persists past commodity production, and on the other that um, un you know, what, what we're calling figuratively here unalienated labor is something that the, the wealthy might have access to or are simply people who are, who are performing tasks um, outside of the sale of their labor power. Uh, and, and so I was curious, um, especially, uh, uh, and I wanted to, to hand this back to Josh, um, whether there seemed to be uh, types of, of labor in your experience as a practicing psychoanalyst, sor sorts of work that people are engaged in, um, which, which would strike you as a, for their own sake or, or providing something uh, besides, uh, you know, besides wages, what work, whether work for, for, for this set of people or for any subset of people is capable of being something uh, besides the thing that we have to take respite from, uh, the thing that we can only hope of shortening uh, or, or pausing. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I want to preface by just saying I don't want to claim too much authority um, about uh, the um, sort of the, the practice, the work practices of the super rich. I, I, I sort of practice psychoanalysis in a very ordinary residential area and my the the, the the you know sort of bulk of I, I don't work in town where people see you know <clears throat> uh super rich clients for, for 250 pounds an hour or whatever sadly um but um I have seen uh people from that sector of our society and in a way it seems to me that the opposite is true um, that the very wealthy, and I think actually um, succession was sort of, I mean, for me, the brilliance of that series is that it's an, an anatomy of the misery of, con, uh, of uh, neoliberal capital and current conditions of labor, which is concentrated in the story of a single billionaire family that actually uh, the vicissitudes of their um, uh, intimate and working dramas uh, uh, are somehow the malaise of the entire society, um, and and everything can can sort of be found in some kind of distorted concentration there. Um, but I think that there's something about um, membership of this elite wealth sector that actually exacerbates misery and which makes it all the more difficult to imagine anything like unalienated labor. And this is not, of course, a pity, pity the billionaire story, um, 
it's 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 just a, a kind of uh, a sober observation that when you use your money um, to go off and do something valuable and productive, whether it's 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 charity work or or you know or, or art making or some other species of um, uh, un uncoerced labor. Um, <clears throat> It tends in the end to get fed into the maintenance of um, a certain brand image and uh, a certain status that is saturated by anxiety and shame. I've come across people in particular um, who make art initially because they have that their, 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 you know their money affords them the means to do that and rather than being some kind of haven of unproductivity in a studio which doesn't have to worry about its status or about selling or about uh, a profile it becomes all the more saturated with a kind of a, a, a shame and an imperative to 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 sell and to be recognized and, and achieve some kind of profile in the world i think there's 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 something in other words about being the representative of capital that doesn't allow you a neat exit from it and and, and probably you know that that is most sort of graphically um illustrated by by both the very rich and by the very poor if I can put it that way, that, that that's that's the, the a kind of place of convergence, of of, of distorted convergence. Thanks, Josh. Um, I know some of our panelists have to get going, so I wanted to offer them a brief chance to uh, to say any closing remarks. Um, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Josh, Richard, and Sarah again for, for having shown up today um, <laughs> of their own free will. Uh, it, was a, it was a really lovely panel um, and I, I highly encourage all of you to, to go out and, and buy their books. <clears throat> Thanks for putting up with my croaking. Oh, thanks everybody. And thanks, Lydia, for such great, that was really expert chairing. Thanks, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm also, I'm also slogging through, uh, slogging through illness for uh, <laughs> um, autotelic labor, I guess. <laughs> and uh, on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, Luke, if you want to, uh, stop the the webinar i'll let i'll let panelists uh get to it